For those of you that don't know me, um, I'm um, the founder of Proxama, um, Neil Garner. I've been living in Norwich for about 12 years. I've actually been in mobile and mobile commerce for about 20 years. Um, mobile commerce is probably only getting into you know, its flow at the moment, and I think there's a huge long way for it to go. So what I'm just going to talk through today is a little bit about um, mobile and the growth and change and evolution of mobile and where it's going to go in the future. And I'm also going to add a few extra slides in as well um, to talk through about what Proxama's view is and what we're trying to do of our role, we think, in the, in the new mobile phone um, commerce ecosystem. Um, and as, as Paul asked me back very kindly to do it, and when I did it last time, actually, I picked a completely new interesting theme, which is because I know my subject, I thought I'd actually um, take snapshots of the Times newspaper and actually put those in as my slides to kind of actually kind of reinforce the theme that actually all the things that we're talking about are mobile are happening today. So what I've done, rather than actually making some new slides and to make it the same presentation as last time, is I've actually used slides from um, the 26th of February, which is when the last event was, and actually used those same things. So excuse me, the theme back then was uh, mobile commerce, but illustrated according to what's going on in the Times on that particular time. So the first thing I talked about was, if you looked at the, the Times newspaper, the topical thing, you always get some quite interesting, cute little monkeys that uh, kind of come up in there. So that was the very first thing to kind of start as a, the icebreaker on my presentation, is, is the cute monkey. But it, when you start to look into the newspaper, there's more than just cute, cute monkeys in there. Is if you take the, um, the iPad edition of, of Times, you probably see a lot of the adverts being mobile adverts. And one of the things that I think was important to kind of look at all of this is like, how cheap's an iPhone now? You know, the iPhone C's come out now, you know, 29 pounds up front, you know, so the cost of a mobile phone tariff infrastructure service are actually significantly cheaper than the cost we're paying for Sky, broadband at home. So the actual cost structure of a mobile device with the computing power that a mobile device has got and the connectivity it's got is now actually becoming cheaper and more accessible than a lot of the fixed line comms infrastructure that we've got. And that's got a significant role to play in the global ubiquity of mobile devices, which I'll come on to a little bit later. So there's another little article that was in the paper at the same time again, which I think is quite topical. This was actually a month ago, is it was the first time a man's actually lost to a machine at computer games. So there's two things interesting here, is that Human beings are generally better than computers at many, many things. So a lot of what we're using mobile devices and technology for are now starting to augment humans. And if the things I'm going to come into a little bit later on, like wearable technologies, is the ongoing trend that's happening isn't sort of robots and androids and things completely replacing human beings, but mobile devices and technology kind of augmenting what we can do as human beings, giving us better sensors, better data, better information, better assistance with kind of services. But ultimately, it's still the human being and the human brain that's making the decisions. But the technology we're now applying is actually allowing us to make and infer and learn and get better data to kind of do all these sort of things. So I think that's quite an interesting one because despite all the power that we've actually got in computing, is it's still very difficult for a computer to beat another computer at something simple like a computer game. And actually, if you look at a lot of the technology that I was working on 20 years ago, which was voice recognition, speech recognition technology, the sort of stuff that's in services like Siri today on mobiles, is I came away feeling that that was almost an impossible <coughs> task to achieve because the human brain is so good at listening to conversations in heavy noise, picking out what a sense of a sentence is, understanding different accents and so on. So I think we've still got a long way to go to kind of manage the, the human understanding of things. So another thing that's important going on, this, this was actually around the time when um, BT was looking to acquire a network operator. We've had a lot of consolidation going on in the mobile phone industry. If you look at what's happening now, we've got Vodafone, everything everywhere and effectively BT consolidating. So what you're finding in the mobile phone industry is network operators are going back to being a bit pipe. So they've dabbled in 
payments, they've dabbled in music services and so on as well. But if you think of all what a network operator is doing, they're just providing airtime. And they're doing it in a more cost-efficient way going forwards. So one of the big trends I think we're seeing is actually the mobile network operator losing their power. One of the things I've seen personally from a lot of the work that we've been involved in is this concept of a mobile wallet, is the fact that the network operator has been trying to make mobile wallets work for quite a long time to get into financial services, to get into loyalty. But actually the fundamental thing is, is mobile network operators are very good at selling phones, selling airtime, providing support, providing trust. But actually on many, many other things they've tried to do, they've pretty much failed to do it because they're a network operator. Just again reinforcing the point of, of Sky Broadband, I still don't quite understand how Sky can justify the prices that they charge for services that are available online for free, that you can get, if you're technologically savvy, in a way by connecting broadband to your device. But that reinforces another really important point about consumer electronics and technology, is if the consumer experience is good enough, then people will pay for the service. You know, so actually Sky have done this very well, in actually they've created a service that's pretty compelling with good content, and people generally move house and go, I need Sky, without necessarily thinking about the other options, the broadband options and so on we're kind of looking at. And again, the strange thing is, it is more expensive to have a Sky contract with television and so on, than it is to get a mobile contract with good data. And that's becoming even more important when we're looking at um, sort of developing countries that um, sort of come on to in a minute. There's another important trend that, um, I'll illustrate this with Lego, interesting stat, there are 102 Lego bricks for every person on the planet. <laughs> so every person on the planet has got an average 102 Lego bricks. Now, the reason I think this is really important is, is there's two themes here. Is what we all do as software engineers and developers is play with Lego. We've gone way, way past the, the initial stages of writing a bit of machine code that can get some text on a screen or doing keyboard scat capture to get data from a keyboard to do something or doing some basic networking. Everything we're doing now is really systems integration. We are in the process of taking bigger and bigger and more chunky and complex and better building blocks to make more and more impressive and clever technologies and services that we're kind of linking together. And I think that's the real trick of software engineering these days. So BT definitely wants me to use their Wi-Fi. Um, software engineering is actually working out what's the current state-of-the-art best building blocks I should be using and which of the building blocks I can't get rid of anymore because there's legacy, and how do I then maybe, as a service provider, provide my own building blocks for somebody else to use? So those are all the kind of key fundamental decisions facing the industry, is actually particularly in mobile, is, is what libraries, what capabilities, what functionality, how do you build the services? And then when somebody like Microsoft or Facebook or Twitter or somebody comes along with a new service, that can potentially disenfranchise an organisation that's made a very nice business of providing some integration capability. And overnight, you can get a lot of um, changes. The other important piece about this Lego thing is Internet of Things. So the imagination point of, what if all of those Lego bricks had a chip in it? If all those Lego bricks had a chip in it that could compute work out where it was, where it was performing, how it could connect to the rest of the world, what would that mean for us and what could we do with it? And I think if you think of it along those terms, if everybody's got 102 Lego bricks and actually potentially those things that we have can actually have technology in them, then that's the world we're moving towards. And actually, ultimately, it's the mobile device that will provide the connectivity between those little things that are around us and the rest of the world. So if you look at all the wearable technologies that are coming through, the mobile sensors, the stuff you can put onto wine bottles, there's, there's a, um, in our industry, um, an innovation now with Diageo putting NFC tags on wine bottle labels where if you open the bottle, it changes the characteristic of the tag and you can tap your phone on it and find out where the wine had come from. That's now printable technology that can go into labels. You know, there are now sensors that are going into um, pharmaceuticals bottles 
there are no sensors going into you know, the Fitbits and so on and services. So actually the massive trend that we've kind of got going on now is actually chips, sensors, capability being embedded in devices that mobile devices can interact with via Bluetooth, NFC, and other wireless medium. So actually we're going into a universe now where the mobile device and the technology is so interconnected with so many other things that actually the value and services that we'll all be working with are actually managing identity, managing what things can talk to other things, the services you could kind of do, the analytics and the data. Just imagine if every day each one of those Lego bricks was actually communicating with your mobile device. How many millions of people are there with mobile devices and how many things are there out there? How much data would get created by all those things that are out there? You know, I think there was a statistic that said um, in the last two years there's more data been created in that two-year period than there has been over the whole, um, the whole life of, of, of human beings. That's going to change faster and faster and faster and faster with all the mobile devices connected to infrastructure. The huge amount of data that we've got is going to be absolutely staggering. There's one other thing that's quite dear to my heart as well. This is a little advert that was in the paper. Cyber unwise, hackers welcome. Advertising the fact that stupid consumers really need to be having very, very difficult to remember passwords to maintain their security. But actually, I think most stupid con consumers, myself included, probably find it quite difficult to remember those very difficult to remember passwords because they're written on a post-it note or maybe stored in the notes file on your mobile phone or stored in somewhere more convenient. So what the whole industry is now doing is, I think, you know, I don't know how many of you kind of work in web services or websites or mobile, nearly everything has got a log on with a username and a password or a reminder that sends you an email to collect the password again or a service where you've got to remember your mother's maiden name and date of birth. How many millions of different ways are there to find out someone's mother's maiden name and date of birth if you really wanted to? And the whole industry is based on this, making the knowledge and the data for authentication harder and harder and harder, but actually for intelligent hackers, easier and easier and easier to go to one place or one repository to get lots and lots of nice valuable information that allows you to log in. So, the other massive trend going on in mobile, over and above anything that's ever happened on PCs, is improvements in authentication. So, you know, I've been working on this for quite a long time now in the payments <coughs> industry, using pin codes, smart cards, dongles, hardware, and biometrics. So, if you look at the capability that's now in iPhone 6, you've got a fingerprint sensor, that can authenticate the consumer to the mobile device. That authenticates itself to a smart chip embedded in the Apple software that can store the fingerprint credentials, can actually validate that phone is authentic and log itself in and validate it to the Apple servers. So Apple knows pretty much pretty well that you are the authenticated holder of that device. My credit card in my back pocket can be stolen and my PIN number could be captured and you can do transactions in my card in a secure way. What's more secure? This or my iPhone 6 with my fingerprint sensor on it? If I'm a bank who's going to deploy services and at the moment most banks have a, if you've used online banking or business banking, a smart card, a PIN, and a little dongle that you plug it into and you type in all the passcodes and it's kind of all clunky. That's the current state of the art for many, many banking systems. Many, many businesses' current state of the art is a one-time passcode generator, which again could be stolen. State of the art moving forwards is the mobile device having biometrics, smart card chips, high security, and therefore from a hacker's perspective, I've got to hack everybody's individual device to get access to a service rather than having to go to a central place to hack services, which is what's pretty, pretty much common at the moment, which is you go to where all the data is, get in there, get lots of data, get lots of credentials, and then use them. If all the data is stored 
in the mobile device, in a smart chip, which it is in Apple devices, that's the major transition that we're going through. One of the big thing, again, this is all the same news day, smart TVs may be sharing your private data. I think everybody's probably very, very aware of the amount of data being collected by us all. Maybe some of the services we're providing and working on are collecting data. The amount of data being collected is fairly frightening in some ways because, you know, smart TVs are actually taking information of what's going on in your living room so they can actually listen to what you're saying, so they can provide you nice, neat services, so it can turn the TV on, select a channel. But to make it work really well, just like Siri and other services, it's got to go online. So the server sitting in the background, listening in to lots of people's living rooms, working out whether or not you've said, turn it on to BBC One, or whatever. That is a great service, but in order to make those services work, you've got to have an infrastructure. Now, who's to say no one's put a Trojan or a bug or a bit of software in that that means that actually I can just listen into your living room and find out what's going on. You know, those are the sorts of issues that we're going to be facing more seriously going forwards is are the devices that we've got collecting the right data, able to talk to each other and actually there'll be lots and lots more things, you know, watches, Fitbits, devices, pill sensors, medical technology, pacemakers, all getting data, all providing valuable services for health monitoring and all sorts, but also potentially able to be exposed and abused by um, the services we were able to kind of make. Another little trend is, th this was before the official launch of Apple Watch, but the, 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 the theory that I've got is, will be seen to be proven as to who's correct or not, is however good an Apple Watch or an Android watch is, and how much clever technology it's got, is it going to look as nice as one of these jewellery watches? You know, how many people wear watches because they look nice, or they show status, or they say something about you, or they're just quirky that you like? Are, are, are we truly going to move to a route where actually we are going to have proper techno watches sold by Apple and so on going forwards? can we not provide the same services on mobile devices? So there's going to be a massive trend for wearable technology, but it may not be watches. It may be technology embedded into clothing. It may be technology embedded into belts or shoes. There's a lot of work that's been done by people like Nike, embedding sensors, chicks, accelerometers and so on into trainers that can communicate with your phone via Bluetooth. You know, so there's lots of things you can wear on your body that can actually do the same things as a watch. So I think the theory that I say is actually watches and Apple watches will sell a lot of watches, but I think you've got to factor in the fact that a lot of these things are fashion accessories and actually there's a lot more things you could wear that can do the same kind of thing as a watch. And believe it or not, Alan Partridge was actually in the same daily newspaper as all this stuff as well. But again, this, this thing illustrated a point which was a lot of the work that we've been interested in, I've been interested over the years, is how do you make declining di um, non-digital media addressable? So the theory is, just because TV or radio or out-of-home media and billboards and print media isn't measurable and addressable, doesn't mean it doesn't work. So if you look at the, on the ongoing trend in the industry, is nearly all advertising services are moving more towards online, social media, Facebook, AdWords, Google, many, many things, mobile advertising, because it's measurable. And we're also in an industry where actually it's based on huge numbers, that I'm more than happy to send out 10 million emails to consumers and only have a 1 or 2% success rate. What about that 99% of people that have actually been quite pissed off by getting an email they didn't want? That's acceptable if the law of numbers says I've actually got one or two percent of those people I sent messages to to actually give me, you know, to, to deal with my service. So I think the big trend we're going to start to see is more and more technologies actually being embedded into things like Shazam, doing things with TV, into radio, so where you can actually use your mobile device to listen to what's going on and connect you directly to a service. What music's being played today? 
what's going online, vote for, the, vote for whatever's kind of going on, can all be done through audio technologies or video technologies. So there's a huge trend again with the mobile device able to make traditional media addressable. This, this is another interesting one, and the reason I put this one on here is actually, this is almost a quiz and I can't even answer it myself, how many brands in that picture? If you look at it really closely, you've got the guy's hat, you've got the, the, you know, the clothing is worn. How many brands are up and down the, uh, the cricket stumps? You've got the brands in the background, you've got his gloves, you've got the, the base of the bat. You know, all these guys are spending huge amounts of money to get their brands somewhere in that picture, in that stadium, in that environment. There's lots of ways going forwards that those brands could spend an awful lot less money and have the same impact. You know, technology is being embedded into videos that can actually spot where there's a place for a brand and replace it. So actually you can see a video or a TV production replacing the brands with whatever you want people to see. You know, you could do that in real time with these guys. But the whole point about the, the, the services are, is actually advertisers pay a huge amount of money in many, many different ways for services. And the mobile device is a way to be able to kind of make that connect and link through in better ways. Because the only reason why people pay money for this is because subliminally they want you to buy something from them. Yeah? So if you can make better ways for this money to make you more able to buy things from those brands, that's a massive opportunity, which doesn't necessarily mean by cramming as much crap into as much physical real estate as you possibly can. If you think about this from, for stuff that's dear to my heart, if, if it was something physical that I could touch or see, or if I could actually scan something on this, and when I did scan it, it gave me a, you know, a web page with all those brands on it, that would be kind of a neat thing to be able to do. And that's the sort of thing you could be able to do with the mobile devices without having to do what we do today, which is, instead of having that, I'm going to have a massive fuck off QR code. Because that's the way to do advertising with mobile these days, is to get huge, horrible, nasty black spots. And that's what we use for engagement. That's all going to change over time, because we're doing a lot more clever image recognition to get us straight to the content we want to see. This, this is one thing that's quite dear to my heart. Um, before I set up Proxama, I was working on a service called M-Pesa. So M-Pesa's actually been rolled out in Kenya. It's a mobile payment service, actually just uses text messaging. So it actually allows people in Kenya to pay each other by sending each other a text message. Initially it was used to pay back loans, and it's now used to pay for anything, airtime, credits, paying each other, paying for services. And I know I believe there's 13% of GDP in that system in Kenya. 13% of the GDP in Kenya is now handled by a mobile telephony system. And this guy here, quite important, is saying, you get a better signal in East Africa than you do in London. And you rarely meet anyone who can't send or accept money with their mobile phone. That's true in Africa. That's true in many Asian countries. Mobile phone coverage, penetration, is growing hugely globally. You know, you think about this. If that's what the guys in Africa and China and Taiwan and various places are doing, and we're not quite there yet in the mobile phone payment revolution, who's actually going to have the dominance in the next 15 years in terms of all the new services that are going to roll out? Look at what's happening in China. Most of the biggest commerce giants and companies are coming out of China. A lot of the technology rolling into these countries is actually totally transforming people who don't have banks, don't have broadband, don't have PCs, don't have all the infrastructure that we're used to, but can pay each other through their mobile phone. Real, today, happening, significant proportions of the GDP. Another little picture I quite liked as well was actually, you know, guys on their bikes in Pakistan, two of them on their mobile phones. It's a very efficient, but two on one bike. But the story is, in Pakistan, they're going to be rolling out a fingerprint national ID scheme on a card across the whole country. The answer is, yes, they can, because they're a little bit more of a um, you know, regime-oriented government than we are. But again, if you've rolled out something that can help protect and manage identity on that wide basis, they will have better identity management infrastructure than we have. 
because we decided, sorry, not to go ahead with those sorts of surfaces. BT needs shooting. Mm -hmm. I'll have to just cancel that. I don't want BT's hotspot. I'll kill a few windows in the background here. No. Ah, here we go. Technology, eh? <laughs> ah, the, 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 <laughs> this was another one. Um, this lady here is a UK citizen who's created her own lesbian and bisexual social dating app and he's now exporting it to the States. So, so my point was, you know, because of the connectivity, the technology, the services, the brains that we have over here in the UK, it means that everyone can create their own bisexual and lesbian dating app if they wanted to and export it to the States because the barriers of entry to new services in the market are pretty low. So again, from a, you know, all of the guys here in the room perspective, is there's no reason why you can't create services, platforms, technologies, and export them in a far easier way than you ever could before. You know, apps and services are infinitely easier to kind of do. And then the last little thing I did on this section of the slide was, was, was I, I feel sometimes, you know, here in Norwich or um, here in the UK, with this kind of little guy here, surrounded by armed guards, you know. So, so you know, the, the thing, thing there is, like, let's champion the little guy who's kind of... Um, sort of pushing things forwards. And I think that's what a lot of the services that you know, see, we, we see we're kind of working on is actually that you, know, you can do an awful lot more as a little guy than you ever could before, you know, despite of what all the big behemoths, the Microsofts, the Googles, the Facebooks, the Amazons, you know, they've, they've had their day to some extent. And actually there's a new breed of services that can come through to kind of drive a whole bunch of innovation. So that, that was the slides I went through um, at the last um, event, and I don't know how much time I've got left. Just over 10 minutes. Okay, so what I was going to just tag on to it was a little bit about where we as Proxama fit into all of this. So we, we've coined a term that we call proximity commerce. So the key to that for us is actually how you connect physical with digital. So that's my, my biggest theme that I've been really passionate about over the years, is how do I make the physical world experience work better using technologies on mobile? So how do I do things like go past a billboard or a poster, get relevant information when I'm there that can maybe encourage me to go to a store or a place, to maybe prompt me something that reminds me of stuff I can do in there, that maybe prompts me of things when I'm in there that actually encourages me or finds, gets me information about stuff I'm interested in. Then the holy grail for many retailers is if I've got something on my device and I've engaged with advertising, I can then take my phone or my device directly to the point of sale and use it just like you'd use a loyalty card today. So you can just close the loop between an offer or an incentive or a card you've got on your phone just by tapping your phone onto the point of sale. Technology is now available to use your mobile phone to pay. We've been working on it for a number of years. So Apple Pay in the States has now launched, come into the UK imminently. That means you'll be able to pay with your phone contactlessly just by tapping it to point of sale. Then the whole piece about physical commerce next is you've just done a transaction, you've bought it in a store, you leave the store, and then you get reminders to say, thank you very much for shopping, here's something for your next visit. All of this is modelled on what we do online. You know, the whole thing that went into our thinking for this is how do I turn what works today for Amazon and Google and AdWords and so on into stuff that you can use in the physical world, i.e. how do I get a page impression when I go past a billboard that's got me some relevant content? How do I track and trace my advert to where I've gone to in terms of a website? How have I then tracked somebody through and encouraged them to go to the checkout? How then have I linked the advertising I've done on different media channels to the checkout? 
I've then entered my credit card details and made a payment. That's all fully auditable. And then when you leave, you can send somebody an email. All those digital processes work very well today and actually where a lot of energy and effort has been spent in the e-commerce era and is now being replicated on mobile. But the big new era of evolution is how do I apply those same principles to the physical world? And that's the sort of thing that we've been looking at going forwards. Um, and really, what's made these things really important is two, two real technologies on phones. These mobile phones for a number of years have had Bluetooth in them, mainly only been exploited for uh, headsets, car linkages, now for music syncing. We bought a company called Hypertag in 2011 that used to put chunky Bluetooth boxes into retail stores with a web server on them that used to work with the old feature phones such that when you went near that box you'd get a, um, an animated GIF or a um, ringtone or something. So that was the early days of Bluetooth proximity marketing. But in their great wisdom, when Apple came out with the iPhone, they decided they didn't want that mechanism to work on iPhones. So that kind of killed that industry when the iPhone came out. Um, we as a company have been working on a technology for 10 years called NFC. So NFC allows cards, tags, phones to interact with the mobile just by tapping them together. So now it's in, available in all handsets. So the use cases coming through on that are interacting with media and the big one that everyone has been focusing on, paying with your mobile phone, using your mobile phone as a ticket, using your mobile phone as an access token. So these two technologies, Bluetooth and NFC, allow push and pull services. So with NFC, use your phone, tap, app gets automatically selected, shit happens, things work, you don't need to worry about it. Bluetooth technology is you've already got a service on your phone, you've already got a loyalty card, you've already engaged. You go near something, things happen on your phone automatically. So we get to a new era of irritating BT adverts is no need to open or select an app before you do anything. We're now in an era where most people are spending all their time and effort saying, I've got to have an app. I've got to build my app to do this. But if you're doing things in the physical world, you've got to remind people to open their right app in the place where you can use it. All this stuff is all about maybe going away from apps, maybe going towards a point where the experience drives the interaction. And that's what these sort of technologies sort of allow. And our, our business is constructed around two things. Um, one, is, a, is what we call a proximity marketing network. And we're now in a process of actually rolling this out across the UK, where we're actually building up an audience of apps that have been enabled with our technology. An audience of physical media locations, so we work with the big media owners, people like Exterior Media, JC Deco, Clear Channel and others, where we actually embed technology into their media sites that means that any app that we've enabled can interact with it. And the main interaction that we want to drive is loyalty and advertising. So actually the holy grail for us is having a massive network of consumers with a network of high footfall locations that people go fast, past on a regular basis that we can overlay contextually relevant advertising of the sort that people are interested in. So it's only information that you see based on where you are, what time of day it is, what sort of things you're interested in. And we found that the work that we've done so far that we're getting average of 23% click-through rates. So actually, if you do this in the right way, an advert is 23% of the time when it's presented gets clicked through and used by the consumer, whereas nearly other advertising technologies don't work in the same way. And the thing that we want to drive is people from that marketing network to the point of sale. So all those lovely little contactless point of sale terminals that are rolling out by 2020, every single payment terminal in the UK and Europe and probably internationally will be able to accept contactless payment cards. They will also be upgraded to be able to accept loyalty cards and gift cards using the same technology, which can be driven by your mobile phone. So we get to a point where we can do add-on poster to someone going into a store and redeeming it at the till. And the other part of our business is working with the card schemes and banks to allow the... Um, the card issuers who've got your plastic cards today 
to get their cards into an app on a phone that their card can be used at point of sale. So we, we sort of do both pieces of it. So we work internationally with schemes and banks to enable this. And everybody here is going to be very excited to hear that at some point this year, Apple's going to be coming along with Apple Pay, which will totally transform everyone's attitudes to using cards at physical places. Because it's already launched in the States, and the States is behind us in contactless card penetration and terminal penetration. But as actually in the space of about three or four months, has already demonstrated huge consumer take up, basket size uplifts, more usage than has been expected on this. And that's going to come to UK and other territories very soon. And that's going to totally transform the attitudes of consumers to mobile devices. I don't know how much time I've got left, but I might just skip over a few little bits and pieces. But <clears throat> the one thing I just want people to think about is actually what we're trying to do is to call, create what we call a hyper-local mobile advertising network, which is all about the right place, the right time, and the right frame of mind. So if you've got an app, many people we've talked to say, I've got an app, but no one's using it. They've downloaded it, but it's not being used. So what we're trying to do is to say, you're in the right place, you're on the bus, you're on the taxi, you're in the underground, you're at a shopping centre. The right app for you is the loyalty card for Tesco's. You know? So then you take advantage of the places where people are dwelling, they're wandering around, a bit aimless, a bit bored, need a bit of entertainment, and you've got the right frame of mind. So, you know, I'm on a shopping trip today, so it'd be quite nice if I did get some special offers. Or actually, I've been shopping in the centre of Norwich, and actually, if I can extend my trip and go and have a few drinks in the evening and a nice meal, that'd be kind of quite nice as well. Or maybe if I did all those things and I got free car parking, wouldn't that be quite nice? Because it helps me. So, what we're trying to do with an organisation we're working with is create what we call surprise and delight, where the messages that we think we're advertising works is something that goes, oh, that's cool, I didn't know I could get that, that's really interesting, I like that, rather than, oh, God, forget that, why are they sending me that nonsense for? All of this stuff is about context, and that's the big thing that we think is really important going forwards. And, um, just one of the few things, so, so we're, not, we're not completely barking mad, so in the, we're in the process at the moment of rolling out a network across, we've got technology already in all the Norwich buses, all the buses going in and out of the city at the moment have got beacons in them, we've kind of been working with Exterion for that, so Norwich was our test place. So in buses, we've got taxis in London that are enabled, so we can actually go into the taxi and get messages when you're sitting down. Trains and tube stations, um, you know, you go on a train, you go into a tube, you can get messaging linked to the advertising billboards. We work with airports, so you go to the airport, you get messages about the duty-free or the lounge. Um, shopping centres, the obvious one, is you go into the shopping centre, it tells you what's going on today and what special offers there are. Um, in retailers, going to retailers, restaurants, cafes, pubs, bars. Bus shelters, probably quite a few of you have seen around the little clear channel bus shelters. If you look, you'll see random things going on on my screen, again. Um, and I'll, I'll give up with BT in a minute. Um, and the last thing I was just going to say is, because we're quite passionate about what we've been doing, we, we launched a service called Loka in Norwich, which you may have seen some of the advertising for. So we launched it as a pilot in October to get merchant feedback and consumer feedback and to get the proposition right. We've taken a lot of feedback on board and we're now going to be enhancing the consumer proposition. Sorry, I've got some nice screens. So we had things like the seat backs. So on the buses going in and out of Norwich, you could tap your phone onto the seat back to download the app. Once you've downloaded the app, it will kind of give you information when you go past one of the stores we've enabled. Just by going near the store, the app pops up and gives you information of what's going on locally. And then some of the merchants have also enabled redemption. So if you've got an offer, you can take it to the till and redeem it. And we're now in the process of getting more merchants signed up, getting more consumers, enhancing the proposition. And hot off the presses this week, we've now got a merchant portal so we can allow small merchants to sign up to basically get content uploaded, get their information out there, get a pack of technology that we can install in their place, because we're now in the process of putting this into the transit hubs, 
the bus station, the outdoor media, retail stores and the city infrastructure. Um, and we're now um, also launched in Jersey. So we've got another place that we're about to kind of drive this forwards. So our strategy really is to now start to drive an infrastructure of locations around the country where you can use this technology and we've got a new app local which we can use and we can also enable third parties to be able to use it going forwards. That's where we are um, and any questions? Yes. Is it going to get to the stage where advertisers are going to try and actually beat each other to pay more to actually be one of the few? Yes. We, we believe so. At the moment, we're working directly with the people who are paying a fixed fee for a campaign for a duration of time. But what's going to happen is we'll have a number of apps on your phone that we've enabled that could work with the buses. So potentially you could have multiple campaigns going on on those buses that are all, you know, and we then make a decision on whether or not you get a message. So are you looking at the identity of the devices that are in the bus and then actually targeting, uh, or thinking of, and then targeting today, the, the, the adverts in this, or the, the services that are being offered in this bus? At, 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 at the moment, because it's newish, we're actually overlaying it on a, if you're advertising on the bus already, then you get that as an extra service. But the follow-on from it is if you've got an app that's enabled in the infrastructure and you want to advertise something on those buses and you're not paying for the physical advertising, then you can pay a fee to get involved and use it. And, and I do think we'll get to a point where you are with AdWords and others. It will become like a demand-based pricing thing that people will pay more or less to get their advertising you know, top of wallet. So we think this is an, an exciting new advertising media type, which is why we've been you know, trying to push this forwards. Two questions. Yeah. Sorry. Um, the first was just your thoughts on using GPS rather than Bluetooth beacons for meeting the majority of use cases, yeah. like static use cases. Um, and also, <coughs> do you worry that if this, when this becomes really, really successful, is there a point at which if every shop in Chatfield does this, it's going to like just massively turn people off? I think there's two, there's two answers to that. GPS only works when the app's active. So if the app's open or sitting in the background, and actually that's a lot more invasive <coughs> because it's actually tracking where you are physically. Mm. Whereas the way the beacons work is that is the apps are just sitting listening to see if it's near a thing it's listening for. So actually we're collecting quite a lot less personal data, movement data, than actually you would be if we're just kind of just mapping and pinpointing your explicit location. So I personally think there's going to be more of a backlash against just apps that just sit there and monitor your every movement, then actually what we're doing is actually very specifically putting things in there that you can or can't opt into. But actually the, what, what we're really doing is just triggering the app. So it's actually giving you a notification and getting the right app open at that right time. And then once the app's open, the apps do all those horrible things they already do already today once you've actually signed the terms and conditions. So you know there's not much more we're actually doing apart from actually enabling to trigger apps. Starbucks is the example I'm thinking of, yes. which does its location aware, like, oh, yeah. Starbucks. Yeah, I mean, the, the, there are quite a lot of services that can do it, but again, the, the location accuracy and granularity mm. is nowhere near as good as oh. NFC tags, which is close proximity, and Bluetooth, which is a few metres. And actually, a lot of these services that we're dealing with are more about triggering an app experience, and typically GPS or whatever is used once something's open. Hey. Okay. When you say you enabled the knowledge buses, yeah. is it just first buses or are you done Easterns as well? I think it's first buses. I think it's 110 buses. So the, what, the, it's mainly the ones that are going in and out of um, Norwich City Centre. Because it's all driven by the, the rest of the, the merchants. You've got the forum and the merchants and various pubs and so on that are enabled as well. So the whole thing was just to trial and test what works and what doesn't work and now we've tested it we know what does work and we can start to you know if you're a merchant you can then overlay your ads on the bus going into town for example which I think is one of the things that a lot of the merchants we work with want us to be able to see. Mm -hmm. Hello. Uh, you mentioned about six or three things um, location, time and frame of mind. Yeah. How do you measure frame of mind? Well um, that, that's a difficult one 
But actually, one of the things that we're, we're looking through at the moment is actually looking at, we can start to infer demographic types. So it may not be frame of mind, but it may be predisposition. Um, and actually, some of the things we're thinking about allowing into the services going forwards are a bit about tell, tell us what you think about these kind of things. So there's quite a few services now that are starting to, to say, if we've shown you something on the phone and you don't like it, we give the option to say, do you want more of this or less of this? So again, that helps us to sort of, we don't necessarily know who you are, we don't know where you live, we don't know all that sort of information, but we know that that user of that phone has got these kind of preferences. And actually, if you're going around certain types of locations, we can start to infer what social demographic type you are on average because of the sorts of things that you're doing. There's more behavioural sort of things. <coughs> Sorry? A bit like Tesco's pub card sort of thing. Yeah, but we don't know where you live, which is the key thing. <laughs> the Tesco's do know where you live. Um, but, yeah, we know, we know where you go, or you, where, where you go in the city centre, at least. Why do you not want to know where they live? Well, we potentially would like to know where people live, but we think that actually we've modelled what we do more on Google. So we feel that we're a connectivity layer. So anything that we do is more of a cookie. So we know bits about you, and then we allow the app owners that we work with to connect our data set to there. So if you work with Tesco, Tesco would know where you live, but we could then give them access to the data that we've collected that gives them more information than they did have before. So it depends on what the, the service is. If it's just to say a, you know, a mapping service or a travelling service we're kind of working with, why should we know where you live? So yeah, that, that's a sort of difference. And do you think um, the new EU privacy laws will make a difference to how your app develops over the next few years? It, 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 it will do. I mean, one of the frustrating things at the moment is things like if an app's tracking data, they're providing prompts to consumers that are a little bit too generic. You know, this app's tracking your location in the background could be done in lots of different ways. And I think um, there's, there's a lot more data protection laws here in Europe than there are, say, in the States. And I think it's getting that balance of, of pri 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 privacy and value. And I think one of the things we're quite keen to do is to try to optimise the value point without necessarily you know, contravening the, pri the privacy piece. And that's why we don't want to know your date of birth. We just want to collect a data set that's actually based on locations and app IDs and so on as well, without us needing to, to well, we don't think we really need to. We can link to other people's data sets that have got that. Should we give it back to the around finish outside? Cool. <laughs>